Today's market call is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. And FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. East Coast, 1 p.m., 25th of March, the last Monday of the month, the last week of the month, which means, Dan, January, February, March, March 3, last week of the quarter. So a lot of strange and odd things can happen without question. And I want you folks just to have Stevie Nicks in your head before we get started. Dan, how are you? I'm doing great. Is it going to be a breakup conversation? Is that what we're going to do here? I just read, I went down this rabbit hole ah. with, with Fleetwood Mac. I think because you had mentioned him probably on Fast Money last week. And you know how like you're sitting in bed and you're just reading a little bit and you caught some... And I, I didn't realize they all kind of dated each other. And then they wrote sure. up songs about each other. And then they were on the cover of Rolling Stone together. And there was a lot of hidden meanings in that cover. And you, you get me. You, you feel me a little bit here, guys? Uh, 100%. I mean, yeah. Chris, what people don't realize, and now we're obvi- Amanda's like, oh, my God. It's on a smart. Monday, the first two minutes, Obviously. you got to do this. But yeah. Christine McVie, yeah. uh, sort of the backbone of that band, songwriter, singer, keyboardist, yeah. when she passed away, I think Stevie Nicks said, and I think the rest of the band members as well, they will no longer tour as Fleetwood Mac, but she was married to John McVie. Uh, Fleetwood Mac would be Mick Fleetwood, the the Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac, and Mac, the Mac of John mm-hmm. McVie. Anyway, yeah. sorry about that. How about that? How about that? Well, a right, little guys. history lesson for you folks. Yeah. Um, so you guys, you and I got a lot of stuff to do this week. A holiday shortened week, by the way. I love yeah. a holiday mm-hmm. shortened week. Okay. So Thursday is really kind of like Friday here, right? So that's what's happening here. So um let's talk about this i mean the likelihood you know we've discussed a little bit about you know the s p and the nasdaq kind of like lockstep that's not something we've seen year to date you know what i mean we've seen the nasdaq definitely the nasdaq 100 outperform the s p 500 the biggest components of the s p 500 are bigger component than nasdaq 100 but they're a lockstep here guy and this to me is just interesting and, and we're going to hit on small caps and we'll hit on some other sectors here a little bit but it says to me that there's a narrowing of the narrowing in the market does that make some sense to you a little bit here you know what i mean because it seems like the rally in the semis which have been driving a large portion of the broader market rally is actually narrowing within the semis too yeah it's interesting and we'll talk about that and i agree with you and it was happening earlier without question when AMD was down around 172 or so earlier today, you know, that appeared the narrowing within uh, the semis was taking place because obviously NVIDIA is still on its horse, but very quietly AMD's down at one point, at least earlier today, about 23% from that peak we made, I think on March 8th or thereabout. And we actually put that on our Insta and you can follow us on the Instagram. So I think your point is well taken and we'll see what that means. If anything, I mean, clearly the broader market has not been all that concerned. Although, you know, last week at the end of the week, we sort of saw some signs of weakness. We're seeing it a little around the edges today. We shall see. But before we even get to that, let's take a look at our rundown. Because I mentioned the great Stevie Nicks and people will be like, all right, what are you effing talking about? What happens after the melt up? Well, it reminds me of one of the songs off of Belladonna, After the Glitter Fades. So what happens after the glitter fades and what happens after the melt up? Listen to the song if you want to know what happens. Small caps, breakout or breakdown, energy boost. And you know what? Because we get questions every day, we'll take a couple questions today if time permits. Yeah, matter, matter, oh, fact, um, when glitter fades. It, it's After fade. the glitter fades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Basically, would... what she's saying is, you know, she gets it. Like when you're a rock star and all this shit's happening, but what happens after the glitter fades? Well, listen, I just got an update guy from the Ticketmaster. She's still touring after all these years, man. She As a solo that, artist. She joined that band in like 1975. I, I actually could go through the whole the whole show. Mm. All right, let's do it here. Um, what do you want to start with here, guy? Because let's again, look at the S. I mean, it's a futures day. So let's yeah. take a look at the S&P, at the E-mini futures, just to sort of see where we are. Oof. I mean, again, it's seemingly we do this every day, which we do. But this trend line is still intact. Lower left, upper right since late October, early November, in place without question. We've tested it a couple times, have not broached it. You know, let's see again. I mean, quarter end, as I mentioned, strange things happen. We'll see how this continues to perform. We've shown you the channel that this is in. We probably have a chart later on in the show. 
But this is a good place to start, Dan Nathan. Well, listen, you know what's an even like more fascinating thing to talk about? It's like, so all those folks you said, you guys, will you stop with the Mag 7? Stop. stop with the concentration. Will you stop with the MAGA? That was four years ago, the Microsoft, the Apple, the Google, the Amazon. What's really interesting, guy, is that three months ago, the largest market cap company in the US was Apple. Okay. It was over $3 trillion. Right now, it has, I think, a 2.6 trillion dollar market cap it's down 11 percent or so on the year and nvidia which is up 93 percent on the year now has nearly a 2.4 trillion dollar market cap so for all those folks including myself who thought that if apple were to start to underperform you know what i mean you might find some other mega cap tech stocks kind of join the party a little bit well that hasn't been the case and then you've had an nvidia just gain, you know, hundred. Look, look at that. Twelve months, two hundred and fifty-six percent. So think about that. Just do the math. It's a two point four trillion dollar market cap company. It's made. That's not normal, though, guy. Can you agree on that? It, it's like that's not a normal occurrence where you will have some stock come from nowhere and more than make up for the market cap losses on a relative basis of one of the biggest leaders. It's just that's what's kind of unheard of right here. Kim, when you say out of nowhere, I mean literally. Well, it's not that it's out of complete nowhere because people were talking about NVIDIA, you know, probably five or six years ago, definitely pre-COVID for sure. And I actually remember, I think it was in October when Governor Murphy had just been elected. And we had this huge snowstorm in the area. I was not able to get to the set of Fast Money. I only meant, remember that because A, it was ridiculous. And B, NVIDIA reported that day and the stock sold off about 25 or 30 percent. So it was a name we were talking about in earnest for a while, but to your point about seemingly coming out of nowhere, without question, you know, this was not a stock that anybody sort of had AI circled around. It was a graphics chip maker that seemingly had lost their way. And you go back a few Octobers ago, you couldn't give the stock away when it's trading 108. A lot has changed since. But to answer your very specific question about is there anything normal about a company, it's very normal for a hundred, you know, million dollar company to have parabolic moves. When you're talking about trillions of dollars, I mean, I don't think, well, let's put it this way. We've never seen it before. And I don't, I think it's anything but normal. And I will continue to say, and some people pushed back on me last week, you know, that three Fridays ago, that reversal has not been broached. Now it's being challenged in terms of today's price action, but that is still intact. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, you know, like depending upon how you draw the lines and do the chart, it looks like it's been a nice little base since then. And, and could that be the launching pad for another move higher? Sure. I mean, like that, I, I guess, like just to put, you know, too fine a point on it. Sorry, people. Is that again? We've never seen this sort of stuff before. So have fun with it. Enjoy it while it lasts. It's not likely to go from a thousand down to five hundred, you know, in, in one clip or anything like that. So if you're long and you think it's still gonna work and this and that, whatever, just be disciplined. That's all we're saying. Because again, through our experience, that you know, a lot of investors make a lot of mistakes at, at tops. You don't know that they're a top or at bottoms, right? And it's really hard to get back in these stories and that sort of thing. So again, you know, to your point about AMD guy um, and the reversal, maybe they can show the intraday reversal here. The headline this morning, and when you and I were chatting at 930, the headline was AMD and Intel down 4% on mm -hmm. you know new rules out of China about what US chips are going to be able to go into government owned servers and the like in China. And so look at that huge gap. 4%, not, you know, not a small market cap company. It's made it all back, filling in that gap. Intel, the same thing. At its lows, down 23, 24% from those March 8th highs. Intel guy, also down 21% at its lows this morning. So I guess the point is a couple of the other large market cap companies in the semi space have um, not been participating over the last month, month and a half or so. And then Another one, which is not a small name either, which is the Broadcom, which had a big gap after their earnings a week and a half ago or two, um, and has since filled in a bunch of that gap. But to me, again, it just speaks to the narrowing of the narrowing a little bit, Guy. So it's interesting that we find AMD is probably unchanged on the day, but to your point about what got us there, it's interesting that this U.S.-China rhetoric continues, at least through my lens, continues to be sort of ratcheted up. Um, and one has to wonder how this ends. Uh, you know, again, it's not had, had any impact whatsoever on the broader market, but things seemingly are getting worse, not better. And, you know, it's manifesting itself around the edges on some individual names and the market shrugs it off. But my concern has been for a long time, an unfounded concern that, you know, U.S. the deterioration of U.S.-China relationships and the potential 
obviously for a U.S. Taiwan situation to continue to escalate, that is not priced in whatsoever in the market. There's no, I mean, there's no denying that, that that is not priced in. Yeah, I want to make one other point. It's interesting. So I was looking out at AMD in the chart that they just threw up there. And again, this 180 level is kind of interesting because we've been on kind of either side of it, right? You see that huge breakout uh, about a month and a half ago. And then we pulled back to that level. And you could just look at that and eyeball that and say, okay, well, maybe it, it consolidates between 175 and 182 or something like that. That'd be a good level. Company expected to report, I think, on May 2nd or so. And I look at this and I and I go to the options market guy. And I look at the May 3rd weekly expiration. And I look at the 180 calls. Okay, they're about $13.5 or so. You can do the math. Um on a $180 strike, you know, it's about seven and a half percent. That doesn't seem that crazy but if you look at the implied move and how do we figure out the implied move between now and may 3rd we take the call premium at the 180 strike and we take the put premium which is about 12 and a half or so dollars right you can do that math there you're getting to about 26 bucks right divided by 180 and that gives you a 14 and a half percent implied move in either direction that is going to incorporate their earnings. So the options market is not making it cheap to play by any means, even with a VIX at 13 and a level of complacency that I think you and I would both agree for the broader market seems there. But that's why we highlight the fact that look at the volatility you've just seen in a stock like this, meant to be a beneficiary, not keeping pace with the market leader, that sort of thing, doesn't have the products and services. You mentioned a bunch of times, this company reported on Jane 31, they did not beat meaningfully. They did not guide in a way that was commensurate with the sort of breakout that we saw from 180 to 210 or whatever the heck that was. You know what I mean? So again, this is where stock picking, I think, becomes really important. And how you choose to express those views is going to become increasingly more important as we get longer in the tooth in this kind of AI rally. No, And your point is well taken that the volatility is finding itself in individual names has not made its way into the broader market at all. But we can and people say you're cherry picking and it's true to a point, but these are not small companies that we're talking about when you have moves of these magnitudes up and down, by the way. Right. So the yep. volatility is clearly there in these larger names on an individual stock basis. But for whatever reason, the broader market seems to discount the entire thing. The question I guess one has to ask is, I guess, one, why? And I can't answer that. But I think the more question is, how long will that last before? You know, volatility does find its way into the broader market. All right. So let me ask you a question. It's a trading question. Okay. So let's just say AMD, let, let's pull that chart up there again. Okay. Let's like, like a one year or something. So it's pulled back to this kind of 180 level. That was the mm -hmm. level that it broke out when it had that huge day. It was the last day of February, the 29th, right? You see that big up day. It was a new all time high and then it kept on going. Would you rather right now, if you were bullish on AMD, okay, and you thought they were going to put up a big quarter and a big guide, and let's assume that it's May 2nd, that's the confirmed date. I think it's um, tentative right now. Would you rather buy the stock right here at $180 or would you rather buy the May 3rd expiration weekly, okay, 180 call, let's say for $13 for, you know, 7% or something like that? What would you rather do right now? So you obviously the leverage and options works for you on your behalf. I mean, but the you know the erosion over time works against you as well. The on the flip side of that coin is you know you long the stock here. You know the right level to stop out is probably either today's low or sort of that one sixty eight level. I think that was the price the day they reported on the thirty first. But I'll answer your question specifically. I think you're going to get more if you're right. If your directional bet is right. You're going to get more bang out of your buck being along the options, I believe. Yeah, but but your point about the decay, I mean, if, well, this, that's, if it was going to sit here in a consignment. So right. The reason I wanted to use this as an example is like if you're buying the stock here, then you have to think about what do you think your downside is between now and the next month. And that's why figuring out the implied movement in the options market can be really helpful because that's what dealers are expecting, about a 14.5% move in either direction. So if you expected, all right, so down, let's say 10% would be $18, right? Down 14% would be down 24 or whatever, you know what I mean? That sort of thing. That's what the, you know, let, that's what, in that, you know, the options market is suggesting. And then if you were just to sit on those calls on a 13 VIX for the broad market, and let's say things do just simmer and they go sideways, you're going to be losing money every day. So 
every day. Again, you just have to reevaluate what you think the risk reward, and you might as well just wait until earnings if you're just trying to play it for that event. Except unless you thought, you know, it's expectation of a run up. Theta, theta bleed, as they say. Well, but there you go. But that's the conversation, right? And that's what people struggle with, and that's what they try to figure out. You know, the, there's obviously there's a longevity to being long in underlying stock without question. You don't erode, but obviously, you know, you don't get the same leverage that options provide. The flip side of the coin is, you know, if things were just to move sideways, you know, each day you're going to, you yeah. sort of erode away that option premium. So it's a tough game. B listen, being right directionally in options when you're right, it's huge. Of course, the timing of these things are what's so critical. All right. Well, here's one. Let's look at the NASDAQ 100, the E-mini futures here, okay, or the mini futures here. Um, so this is interesting to me. Okay, guys. So we talked about this in a few occasions on Market Call over the last week or two that, you know, any given day, sometimes it looks like the NASDAQ 100 futures are up. Uh, or less or down, you know, up less than the S&P. And that's not something we've seen too frequently. Let's pull up this chart real quickly here because this thing looks like it's been consolidating. It looks like it's a 45-ish degree angle. You know what I mean? Off those October lows. That's what we've basically seen. Look at that 200-day moving average, the way that's moving up. It's the same slope, right? But this thing looks like it's also consolidated a bit in and around that kind of 18,000 if we want to pull it a little tighter too. You know what I mean? And so... You know, might it be setting up for, you know, like uh, a, another move higher? You know, when you just kind of look at the midpoint or you look at the closes, right? You see where those closes are. You get a sense for this is, feels like a bit of a consolidation. So the question is, is the NASDAQ 100, which is really dominated right now by obviously uh, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, Meta, you know what I mean? Is it about to take another leg higher? You know, we're getting to quarter end. We're going to have earnings. That, well, I guess Netflix is usually like it's going to be middle of the month. And then towards mm -hmm. the end of the month, we're going to have the cluster of all the bigger names. You know, like the question is, uh, you know, what 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 is the thing, guy, that would cause investors, you know, to get a little nervous about a lot of these names that have come a long way in a short period of time? Wow. Uh, what would get them nervous? You know, some, I think the headlines that we saw today, I believe, I mean, that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg, so the but stuff, you think U S China. Yes. I mean, those chip wars that are seemingly continue to go on that made people nervous for about an hour today. But to answer your question, you know, an escalation of that, I think would get people nervous, but short of that this week, you know, I think you're going to see, I mean, history suggests in the absence of news, you know, the markup and the melt up in the quarters is typically something that happens. And I don't think it'll be any different now. So it would not surprise me to see this continue. But what I will say is, you know, at some point, fundamentals do matter and technicals do matter. And I still go back to those three Fridays ago. That reversal is still in place. So I don't know if I answered your question, yeah. but I but you yeah. know, that's what is sort of that day to me is concerning that three Fridays ago is concerned. All right. And so, so what I think is really important about your answer to that guy on that day, on March 8th, there was nothing fundamental. It was no. basically, you know, one seller went for the door in NVIDIA, then a couple sellers came in, then they started selling the SMCI and then they started selling Broadcom. And then, so, so it was a bit of a snowball effect. The one thing I say, if they could draw a quick little uptrend on these E-mini futures here on the NASDAQ, you know, listen, if you're long and you're looking like, you know, if you think this thing could break out or something like that, you know, it's pretty easy. You just said it, you know, you like use the technicals as your friend in a way, you know, that uptrend is like 18,180 or something like that guy. You know what I mean? So if you're probing this and you're trying to use the futures to play for a breakout, if you see on a near term basis, a consolidation, you know what I mean? Above that uptrend and you see a little, what you think is a sideways sort of action, you know what I mean? You're going to want to like stop it though at that uptrend because at some point, sometimes it's just technicals, right? It's just a sentiment shift and technicals could cause that thing to go lower. And as that 200 day is working higher, you know what I mean? Sooner or later on a pullback, you're going to get a convergence of that. And you want to make sure you're stopped at certain levels that make sense. And, and th that uptrend makes perfect sense if you are long the NASDAQ E-mini futures. Here. You know, this is, this is, I, I hope, this is not lost on our audience, but I'll, I'll I'll effort an explanation of something. Typically, we associate stops with losses because the two go hand in hand. A yeah. stop loss, right? You have a you're long a stock, you put a stop loss lower, um, and you get out of a bad position. So stops ninety percent of the time are associated with getting out of a position and losing. 
you can also stop into a position. And now I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But you know what you could say is, you know, you want to put a sell stop or a sell order based on that trend line. So you're selling something into a trend line. And I know that's sort of, you know, higher level stuff, but we used to, you know, sell stop of, you know, you're not long it, but you want to get short something on the break of this trend line. And with each passing yeah. day, that trend line, that level gets higher and higher. So if we were just to go sideways for the next couple of weeks, that sideways action would actually break the uptrend line and you can sell stop into a short position, especially with futures. I mean, that's probably for another show, a little higher level shit, yeah. but I thought I'd mention it. That's some good that's some good stuff. All right. I, I want to pull this up. This was a story. Um, I, I think it was in Bloomberg, and we'll put it in the show notes here. So Ed Yardeni, um, mm. a lot of folks, uh, you know, kind of label Ed, and uh, you know, we've had him on our pods before. I really like him, like his work, smart guy. Um, you know, this was a note, and I think it's interesting. Stocks, uh, 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 stock bulls backed by Fed, uh, showing uh, risk of a bubble, and and so, but he also warns guy that you know bubbles when they inflate and they get over exuberant, and like like when they pop, they go the other way too. And you know, that's something that you and I have, you know, reminded our listeners, our viewers, and we probably still have a little PTSD from different mm -hmm. periods, and you know, just the way things overshoot, and as good as they feel when you're enjoying the inflation of a bubble, when they go the opposite way, it's just nasty. And think about 2022, like that was also one where that was like a low vol bear market. It was just kind of every rally, meaningful rally, and there were some big ones. You know what I mean? There was some 18, 19 percent. They got sold. You know what I mean? And but you know, again, you know, they kind of bottomed out at some point, and that was usually a sentiment sort of thing. So talk to me about this because is it interesting? You know, I know a lot of folks I, I see in my messages, people saying, all right, when Dan goes bullish, that's kind of going to be the top. You know, when you have guys like this who've ridden this bull run here, um, when they're saying, you know, maybe it's time to be a little cautious because that's what I take away from this guy. Well, I mean, think about it. He's been right. And he's not, I know you know this, but it's important to point out. I mean, he's been bullish. He's been right. I mean, there've been t times in history where he's not. So we all get labeled, and that's fine. Your point about 2022, it was a low vol. The only it's interesting. The times of volatility did speak in 2022, with the two times that he had to buy the market. It happened in June of that year, yeah. and it happened again in October of that year. And we actually highlighted it both times. Uh, 2022 was a year that actually did make sense to me. But to go back to Ed Yard, Denny's note or point, or what he's saying is, you know, melt ups are great when you're long things, but Melt up, melt ups lead to sort of meltdowns. And again, I think you saw glimpses of that a couple of weeks ago. And when the market then subsequently shrugs it off over the next couple of days, people say, ah, it wasn't a big deal. See, but you're getting a glimpse as to what could possibly happen and what that could potentially turn into for the broader market. Yeah, and you know, one thing that um, Liz Young highlighted to us this morning as we were recording the On The Tape podcast, mm. just, just a quick point, is that just some of like what she's seeing where utilities, consumer staples, some defensive sectors are starting to act pretty well here. So just the money moving into defensives, might it just be a broadening out or is it a move to be a bit more defensive, which brings me back to that NASDAQ versus the S&P kind of at similar percentages up on the year. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep an eye on. Um, the other thing is, and this is our little breakout or breakdown segment, you'd also like to see the small caps in the form of the Russell 2000 confirm those all-time highs that we saw in the S&P and the NASDAQ last year, despite this thing still being 15 or 16% from its all-time highs from November 2021. Talking about this chart here, again, it's just kind of grinding. It's held that uptrend. You see the move off the lows there. And then on a five-year basis, this is a, a level or a range that you've talked about a lot, Guy. I mean, it's been volatile. We've kind of established a new range above those highs that we saw throughout the, you know, a good part of 2023 and earlier this year, but we haven't broken out yet. I don't know what to make of this. I mean, I'll tell you, I, again, obviously one would think that if small caps are finally able to participate through the lens of obviously the futures here, or if you're in equity through the IWM, whatever you look at, that would be constructive for the broader market. That would be the final piece to the puzzle. Okay, small caps are finally participating. That's backing up or galvanizing or re whatever word you want to use, the broader market strength. I get it. There's also a school of thought that could potentially say, you know what? If the broader market moves, in other words, technology specifically, but then the broader market sells off in a meaningful way, the flight to quality can, you know, counterintuitively might be in the form of 
small caps, which people might view as value plays in a falling market. So there's a, I think there's a 50 50 chance that if broad cap, if small caps move higher, the broader market cooperates and does the same, or it could be a flight to perceived safety in the form of small caps as the broader market selling off is looking, people are looking to get out of high value valuation names into names they can wrap their head around. I don't know what to make of it. I'll say this though, if you go back to that chart with the box, we are clearly at the upper end of this band in terms of resistance. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens either way. Yeah, let's pull up the KRE. This is the S&P Regional Banking Index. And this is one that's kind of interesting. We know that there's in the in the Russell 2000, there's a bunch of small cap sort of banks too. And the KRE is interesting to me, Guy, because, you know, late last year when the market was breaking out in December, if you look at a one-year chart really quickly, it had that huge big up day. It was December 13th. It was the, the Fed presser when, mm -hmm. you know, it was dovish and people were pricing in six cuts this year and as all systems go. It's interesting. The next day, Guy, the next day it gapped up and that was it. And it's been, you know, just kind of a, in, in a bit of a downtrend and hasn't really been able to get out of its own way. I think that's really interesting. I'm not just trying to find things that kind of confirm my hope that we have a 10% pullback, that sort of thing a little bit, but this would be one of them. And the lack of the Russell, I think, to kind of make a, a establish a, a new range or make a run back towards its all time highs. That's another one too. Yeah, 100% agree. I mean, small and regional banks, I think what we saw there in the absence of bad news, those things sort of levitated. And then to your point, when you got that Fed presser that everybody interpreted as dovish, that was sort of the next catalyst. But again, longer term charts suggest that they're really in no man's land here. And, you know, personally, I still think there's um, there's sort of more pain to come on the small and the regional bank front. And that's going to manifest itself in the KRE trading lower. So we'll see. I think the moving average, I want to say, is like 46 or something-ish. Uh, that's a level to keep an eye on. I think we're trading 48 and three quarters now. Yeah. And, and again, both of these groups are obviously very sensitive to rates. And it's interesting. Let's pull up the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield because last week, I think we probably said this four times on market call. Okay, so the 10-year on either side of 4.3%. Now this week, we're saying either side of 4.2%, right? Like, you know, like well, there's been some downward pressure. You can see it. It got up to that kind of, what was that, 4.35 or so guy? Um and, you know, mm -hmm. you can say that's a little bit of resistance. It was the prior high from about a month ago. Um, we're sitting right on that 200-day moving average. You see that little uptrend that it's been in a little bit. So you see the levels there, right, to the upside. And you see the level to the downside. And, and maybe we're just stuck for a little bit. But sooner or later, it will resolve itself. We will have a break one way or another. And so, you know, thoughts on yields and, and what they mean for stocks right now, because I've seen no shortage of sectors that are now, at least some investors are just making all sorts of arguments, um, twisting themselves in a pretzel, why yields right here, right here are great, no matter what happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, so and, and, that is the, the sweet spot of yields. If yeah. yields sort of stay somewhere between, I guess, I don't know, 4% and 4.5%, I'm, I'm putting yeah. a big range, but you know, th that, that'll that be okay. You can have volatility within that band. As long as it stays in it, that's fine for equities. And maybe that is true. I mean, quite frankly, uh, equities are like just about any interest rate environment, Let you know, short of a couple of weeks here and there. What do I think about yields? Well, again, you know, I am still, I'm probably one of the few people out there that still think yields go higher for the wrong reasons. Uh, and I don't think that'll be equity friendly. But if yields move significantly lower from here, again, what is that signifying? Did something break? Is there is there market slowdown in the economy? What is lower yields in a meaningful way signifying? And when I say meaningful way, I guess maybe below 3.8% or so on the downside. So I think your point is well taken. I think there is an argument that, you know, in this band, we're fine. Yeah. Um, but I think they're telling, again, you know, I still don't think the inflation dragon's been tamed by any stretch of the imagination. Well, and, and again, that's why we're going like, to, volatility could likely pick up if we start seeing, I know PCEs on Friday, we start seeing, you know, a string of uh, inflationary data that looks a little hot. Um, let's look at the CME Fed Funds tracker here. We're looking at the May meeting guy. That's the next one. Uh, if we think about this and you see that, it's just a, uh, you know, near 0% chance of a cut. Let's go look at June for a second here. This one's been moving around a little bit, guy. And, you know, I know that the Atlanta Fed chair bostic is speaking uh i you know sometime this week and i think he was quoted on friday saying he thinks there's only going to be 
one cut this year, which speaks to kind of the narrative that you're speaking about. I think he wants to, um, you know, make sure, hold out. The economy is fine right now, right? Like hold out and make sure that nothing that they do will cause inflation to kind of pick up again. But here we are, about 63% uh, chance of a cut at the June meeting of 25 basis points. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, I'm sort of in the Boston camp. I don't, I don't see what this, you know, if you look at everything through the lens of, the indicators they look at, there's no real compelling reason to really have to lower rates at this point. Like autopilot to me, sort of staying staying pat makes a lot of sense, especially given all the, you have, you have a lot of basically data that's conflicting right now. And in, in the midst of conflicting data, why do you have to do anything? Because then you're going to tip the scales. Let the data sort of sort itself out, then move accordingly on the back of it. I mean, I'm sure there's still some people out there that wouldn't admit it to think we probably should still have rate hikes in this environment, given yep. where inflation is. But but here we are. So the June, look, I think I think we've all come to the realization that the June meeting is probably where they start. But it goes back to what Liz talks about all the time. Once they start, they're not going to stop. So if June is, in fact, in play, then we're probably on autopilot to the downside. And then one has to ask, you know, although it would seemingly be constructive for risk assets, History suggests otherwise. So this, again, comes down to be careful what you wish for. Yeah, I think your point, the, the autopilot term is a good one because it's what kind of Fed Chair Powell was kind of tagged with. Or maybe they used the, the expression themselves. Probably not. But back in 2018, was it every other meeting they were kind of raising a quarter point, right? And so that was the autopilot thing. And it wasn't until stock market started selling off, growth fears kind of reared their, their head from around the world. And they kind of did an about face um, on those hikes. Um, you know, I wanted to mention this. And I think this is interesting because you have been sort of not sort of, you've been steadfast on energy. And you've been talking about the space from a bunch of fundamental reasons. And you've been talking about the space, this goes back a year. Um, and, and again, you know, they had that huge run up in, in the kind of inflationary sort of period that we saw in early, mid 2022. And then they came off kind of hard. There was a lot of global growth concerns. Look at this, look at this XLE. I mean, that's pretty impressive. We know that three names make up 40, 50% of it or so. OIH is also one that you've been pounding the table on. So I think it's interesting. Morgan Stanley upgrades the energy sector. And this is what I find like fascinating. Mike Wilson is a good friend of ours. Okay, so he's the, uh, the head strategist over there. If you have been listening to Mike, on the On The Tape podcast, he comes on every quarter with us, okay? He's been coming on Fast Money and the like here. He's been talking about energy. He's agreed with you on energy, okay? Now, he's gotten tagged with having the wrong S&P target, with being bearish on the S&P 500, okay? But under the surface, he's talked about a lot of different sectors. And this is not Mike just coming around to energy, right? Like, if you were listening to what he said, if you've been reading his notes, he's been bullish of energy. So talk to me a little bit about this guy, you know, that... that you know, now here we are with the XLE back at 52 week highs and we have, you know, this sort of headline here. But again, Mike's been kind of very supportive of the energy trade for some time now. Yeah. And I hope you have listened to him and we have him on every quarter and he hasn't really wavered on that. And compelling valuation in terms of the energy stocks is a phrase that we've used multiple times for many, many months, if not longer. And it's starting to play itself out. So in my this again just my opinion in order for this to really move in a meaningful way the energy which it has uh in the midst of technology round but if you see for whatever reason um an exit out of these technology stocks the rotation in my opinion is going to be in the energy names and maybe we're starting to see a little bit of that now i mean maybe the weakness in apple is manifesting itself in some of these energy stocks i don't know but again, if you see some of these bigger names start to give it up, I think the beneficiary of that are going to be energy stocks. And some of the names we've talked about, you know, forgetting about the Exxon, Chevron's and Conoco's, the Marathon Petroleum's, the PSX's, uh, the Valeros. I mean, these are stocks that are not making 52-week highs. These are names that are making all-time highs. So there has been underlying strength in the industry without question. I think people will start to take notice. You mentioned the XLE correctly because that's obviously the big one. If the XLE starts moving now in a meaningful way and the underlying three names start to really get on their horse, that's when people are going to start to take notice and say, wait a second, maybe energy is in play here. Yeah, 
uh, again, and, and what, what does it have to do dollar? Um, you know, it's at the, the Dixie. Let's pull this up for a second here. 104 and a quarter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is kind of interesting because it's going the opposite way of the 10 year yield right now, which which, again, I think there's a bunch of stuff at play. We can spend some time talking about the weakness we're seeing in currencies, you know, in China and in, uh, in Japan. And, you know, again, that's kind of above my pay grade. But when I just think of like, what are some of the sort of impediments to kind of growth? If you think about it, maybe a strong dollar is one of them, maybe higher, uh, it, you know, like commodity costs and, and, and the like here. We're seeing sort of wage stuff all over the place, even on the low end or so. So, again, this is the thing to me, guy. And 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 I just like the Fed's job has gotten really hard here like because, you know, they got really dovish and it was odd. What were they thinking back in December? You know, because we talk about loosening financial conditions. Well, that rhetoric loosened financial conditions it basically gave lots of investors in all different sorts of risk assets a whole host of reasons just to kind of just yolo things you know what i mean and now here we are some of the things that could be firming up and cause a pronounced slowdown at some point in the not so distant future you know what i mean like they're happening right in front of our eyes well that goes to so i'm 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 sort of implementing or integrating some of the questions into the answer to this question oh, so the josephs are asking Thoughts on DBA. And a DBA is an agriculture, I believe, ETF. 52-week high inflation indication possible. So that's the question. Not only is it a 52-week high, I think at 40, at 24 and change, this is the highest level we've seen since 2015 or so. So very quietly, uh, this has been getting on its horse. And it's probably, I don't know the components of it that intelligently, but I can say that, you know, cocoa, for those futures traders out there, today is a futures day. And Amanda, I don't know if you can pull up a cocoa chart. If you can't, I apologize. But this thing has been off to the races. And nobody talks about some of these soft commodities, but they've all been rallying. So to answer your question and using that question. Yeah, look at that, Dan. That's a cocoa chart, by wow. the way. So, you know, you say what you want. I mean, this has implications as well for obviously some of the underlying components of the inflation thing that we all monitor. So there you go. I mean, it's one thing for me to talk about it. It's another thing to look at it and see this. Yeah, it's weird. Like, so at what point it seems like, so if you're Bostic and you're some of these other guys in the Fed and gals, you know, like you're recognizing the fact that the, the inflation dragon's not slayed, but they seem very confident about getting down to their 2% target. You know, you know what I'm saying? But yet, but yet the dots keep pushing out the cuts, you know what I'm saying? So, and I was thinking about this through the lens of, of like politics, you know, you, you hear a lot of folks talk about, well, you know, the, 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 uh, fed chair Powell works for the president. The president wants to get, you know what I mean? Reelected. I'm not sure fed cuts, you know, like do the thing that helps the Biden administration because where they're getting hurt on the eco economic message with unemployment, where it is and, 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 you know, all that sort of stuff is inflation. It's what regular everyday Americans are paying, you know, you know, for, to, to put food on their table, to heat their home, you know, all that sort of stuff. So again, I don't think rate cuts are, are that kind of, you know, political sort of, uh, you know I mean? Like fairy no. death that some people think. Well, we're, we're treading into areas that we probably shouldn't, but I'll say this. I mean, if asset prices, were the thing that they're getting graded on. They do extraordinarily well yeah. when it came to the economy. But the reality is, and what they seemingly don't understand, it's got nothing to do with the stock market. It's got everything to do with what everyday Americans are dealing with every single day, and that's rising prices. So if they think somehow magically lowering rates is going to, you know, again, help them on the asset front, they don't need help on the asset front. They need help in other areas. And all that lowering rates is going to do is going to make what's the problem, which is inflation, that much worse. That's just my opinion. And I think, quite frankly, there are smart people that understand that. But it's also politically expedient to say, hey, higher rates are why you're hurting. That's got nothing to do with it, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I get you. All right, here, guy, here's one for you. This is an interesting one. Uh, and I think I really like what he's doing here. OK, this is from Gil Garcia. Guy, are you still hopeful on Palantir? Oh, this see is, that? That's a nice a CNBC, job. This is a CNBC see that? Fast Money fan right here. So thank that you. Is, that, that is old school. Yeah. So my HOPE acronym, was that yeah. the first year we did it? I don't know. Two it might have been. Yeah. But the H and the HOPE was Home Depot. The O was Oracle. <laughs> and the P was Palantir. And 
What I'll tell you is it didn't trade particularly well that year, but it's gotten on its source. So pull up a longer term Palantir chart and you can see. So a lot of people believe that if data is the next oil, Palantir is sort of at the front end of this entire thing. And I think the problem with Palantir was and continues to be to a certain extent, they're too reliant on government contracts. But if they can get some some of these sort of if they can start to move the needle away from government into some of these mid-sized entities, I think that's when they can start, their margins can start to improve. And I think that's when they get the valuation they deserve. So the short answer is yes. And if you listen to, um, I think it's, what's his name? Carp, what's, I can't think of his name, Carp. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. if you listen Carp. to him speak, Alex he, Carp. he tells a great story in terms of what Palantir can be. So yes is the short answer. All right, here's one. We got to hit this one because I really do think it's one of those things that um, is kind of contrary to some of the other stuff that's going on in the markets here, and it's about Bitcoin. So let's pull this up. Um, well, this is it contrary, though? But I'm glad you brought that up. So, yeah, bring it up. Well, I mean, you know, it kind of feels like it. So this is JS. Thanks, Jay. Do the boys have any thoughts on BTC fund flows and specifically the fact that new ETFs don't trade all weekend while BTC does? Now, one thing I'll say is, Guy, I know that you, you know, spend lots of nights and, and you know, over the weekend and you're trading, you know, your, your spot uh, Bitcoin, you know, because you can trade it because you're a junkie. You can trade 24-7. Uh, so the question specifically is now that there's spot Bitcoin ETFs, you know what I mean? Like you can walk in right on Monday morning. There can be kind of big gaps that, you know, are accounting for the activity that happened um, over the weekend. So when I look at this thing, though, I, I don't really, I, you know, guy, I'm sure you don't have much to say on the structure. of these I, I, no, I, do not. No, I don't either. But it is interesting that l let's talk about this. I don't know about you, man. More and more people that I know who five years ago thought this was just a, a fugazi, you know what I mean, are actually considering Bitcoin as a proper risk asset. And I also think that the spot Bitcoin ETFs being offered by some of the biggest brokerage firms and investment houses, you know what I mean, on the planet kind of help the cause here. So it's not just retail being able to have access to this and put it in their IRA, that sort of thing. Obviously, institutions were waiting for this stamp of approval. So again, it's really volatile. Um, but what does it speak to you that, again, the dollar's rallying today yeah. and we're seeing a Bitcoin move like this, right, guys? Well, and that's why I sort of started this by saying maybe it's not as counterintuitive as, as you think because, you know, again, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole necessarily, but what we're seeing in terms of Japan where they raised rates for the first time in 17 years, albeit at a very, you know, insignificant amount. But it's, it's, I think it's, it speaks volumes as to what they need to do. And the fact that they're yen actually weakened on the back of it is telling, I think. And, you know, we don't talk often about currency crises. I'm not suggesting we're on the precipice of one, but you got to watch dollar yen really closely. So I think the stronger the dollar gets against the yen, I think you're going to see continued you could overlay a Bitcoin chart probably with a yen chart, and I bet you they're going to look eerily similar. I don't know that, and we could save it for another show. But I think what Bitcoin is telling you is, you know, wait a second. You know, these central banks got a bit of a problem on their hands, and it's manifesting itself the way Bitcoin is trading. Fair enough. All right, one last question. Oh, hold on. She's going to do this. Look at this. This is pretty unbelievable. Dude, hold on. I want to see if I'm doing I'm actually curious myself if, if this is going to look similar. <laughs> anyway, sorry about um, that. So here, here's one. Um, this is from James uh, Lundgren. And uh, I, I'm reading this one. This is the last one. We got to go because you got to get your, your butt into the city. Um, great show, as always, guys. See, I, I got to you got to take that question. Right, guy? It just gives us well, that. First of all, he I, smiles, which yeah. I like happy people. Yeah. You notice I'm not a big smiler, but James is. So good for you. You are a big spot. Can you speak to the crap that is running today, Atal, the DWAC, that's the um, the SPAC that's going to merge with uh, the, the Truth Social, and then GME, uh, what's going on here? Um, well, GME reports earnings, I think it's tomorrow morning, uh, or tomorrow after the close. <clears throat> kind of washed out. I'm sure there's a lot of short interest. You guys know the drill, meme stock, you know, the like. It's still 23% of the float guy of this is um, is still short here. So again, that's probably what's going on there. And then with the DWAC, um, that just has to do with the fact that, you know, people are going to play games until this thing merges, which is supposedly going to start trading under DJT tomorrow. Um, again, this doesn't seem like a, a normal stock. So this is a $48 stock. It's up $11. Let's see how it starts trading. I mean, if every headline is that this is a windfall for former President Trump 
and he's got obviously a lot of these financial obligations as it relates to you know this this bond that just got reduced dramatically. I don't know if you saw the headline there. You know the idea, the a bunch of stuff, guy that I read over the weekend is that this bails him out. Well, he can't actually do a thing with the shares for six months after the deal closes, which brings you to September. And listen, look at the history of a lot of these SPACs. They have a lot of goofy action until the the the, the, the trade happens, until it's consummated, and then they can just fall apart. You know what I mean? So it doesn't ensure that. Yeah, unless the board gives some special dispensation that will, I mean, I look I, again, but I'll say this, if you want to get a good primer as to what's going on, I think Karen broke down um, DWAC last week. And in terms of what it's rolling into, how the current price based on the revenues and based on what she's looking at and based on the projections that they're not making makes absolutely no sense. So I might've been Friday and I apologize if I'm off by a day, but I think it was Friday's Fast Money that Karen went into detail about this. Uh, maybe we can put that in. The I don't know. Yeah, no, they can we... find it. They'll find it. Yeah, they'll... that video, I think. Karen, will help... in Fast Money, d -whack. it'll come up kind of quickly. Yeah. So she did her so finer print. Guy, don't we call that her finer print? Feinerman's finer prints, yes. There you go. All right. Well, um, the last thing I'll just say, and I'd say this about any meme stock, okay? Like that is obviously a meme stock. And if there was ever a stock that there was going to be shenanigans with, it would probably be that one. So again, you better have uh, your finger on the trigger there, guy, if you're going to play in that one. Absolutely. And that's it. The Rangers do not play tonight. Uh, I was there Saturday night in a right. game that they were losing two zip in a game that they came back and tied. And in the game, they were down 3-2 with four minutes left. Uh, they scored shortly thereafter. Win in a shootout with now the best record in the National Hockey League. I believe they play tomorrow, and Dan's going, aren't you? I am going, Scott. Yeah, no, I am going. I'm glad you got to see a shootout. I mean, like, you know, I, and I'm glad. That's that bullshit. I don't like the skills. Of, I mean, I've never, I'm not an advocate of, I, I, the hockey purists out there are not fans of the skills competition that decides games. It's kind of fun though. All right. Let's put it this way. If an NBA game ended in a tie, let's just, and again, we got to get out of here. Would you want it decided by the two best three point shooters on the team, seeing who makes the most out of the, out of 10? It's dopey. It is dopey, but again, let them finish it on the, on the arena they play, whether it's the, uh, hard court of a basketball or the ice of a hockey well, rink. All right. So just, you were in the world's most famous arena for that game, right? Mm -hmm. What is, what do you think is the most famous multiple overtime game that has ever Pete, Stem, Pete Stemkowski? All right. Well, I was going to say this. No, Syracuse. it was Stefan Matteau. I know what you were going to oh, say. Oh, no, it was Matteau, game seven, double overtime yeah. against the Devils in 1994 to send them to the Standing yes. Cup finals. That's all right. That's the most famous hockey one. Aside from that, Syracuse UConn, you remember that one in the Big East tournament? Six overtimes. Syracuse uh, actually, Hill. now that you say it, it starts, it rings a bit of a bell. Six overtimes. Yeah. And right. isn't that better? Yeah. I mean, that's far more memorable than deciding the end of a regulation game by a three-point shooting competition. Jacob, would, Jacob, you not, you, would not you agree? Yes. Jacob will put that one in the show notes. If you have not seen the highlights of that game, it is yeah. one of the sickest things. I think it went like an extra hour, guy, like after the uh, regulation. So, all right, we'll leave it there at that. Go. That was fun. All right, tomorrow we're back. Tomorrow's Tuesday. I think the great is, if I'm not mistaken, Carter Braxtonworth. He is back. Carter Braxtonworth will be back tomorrow. Wednesday is EY from SoFi. Thursday, if it's Thursday, it's butter. Bitch, yes. All right, um, just really quickly, uh, and I just want to clarify this. I got an email from somebody, a regular watcher. Uh huh. He doesn't love that, but he doesn't what? think. But but the problem is, I'm just. What, what doesn't he love? Hold Man. on, hold on. He thinks you're denigrating him. You're not denigrating. Him. What's going on? Are you on? kidding me? It's a Britney Spears song, right? And it's it's Britney, bitch. You are giving him the highest praise that you could. I just want to make that really I'm crystal really clear. clear. I his work is, I mean, unparalleled. And I have you are a, not I one to let me put it this way. If he was a Johnson, I wouldn't be saying it, right? It's Correct. like it's like if somebody is really in shape and you call him or her, you know, like rotund man or something it's yeah. obvious that they're not yes right or somebody that's six three calling him or her shorty i mean yeah you slim. slim is another one like doyle Lan Do doyle lonigan in this thing you follow yeah you, by the way my dad was he was a little chunky guy he played football and then when he went to play lacrosse this was in in, in college 
Um, he, he was on what they called the fat boy midfield. Okay. So mm. he'd never seen a lacrosse stick in his life and they put one in his hand and they just sent him out there just to be a bruiser. Okay. So, um, and his nickname was slim. So it's the opposite of what you're talking about in a way, right? Like, so, you know, but that's meant to be funny and I'm sure Steve Nathan appreciated it. Cause he was just one of the guys. Yeah. And I, listen, again, people get all twisted about things. I get it. That's the world we live in. You know what? I just want to explain that. I if just it's Thursday, Dan. It's butters. Bitch. We'll see you, po folks, tomorrow. See you later.